So good morning, afternoon, and evening to you all. Uh, thank you for joining us here at C, uh, here for the third Global Leaders Talk. My name is Ann Park, and I'm the Deputy Director of Seed Global, which aims to be the most trusted resource for entrepreneurs around the world. Seed Global is part of the Small Enterprise Assistance Funds, which is an impact investing firm which invests in entrepreneurs with outsized impact globally. We started the Global Leaders Talk several weeks ago to provide our community of entrepreneurs with practical information about how to navigate this unprecedented global disruption due to COVID-19. We are bringing industry experts, leaders around the world to share their stories. But to be frank, there's no expert in the world who can tell us the right way to deal with this crisis. So in the spirit of SEED's methodology, we want to learn as a community by hearing from others who are dealing with the situation now. Today, we are excited to be joined by Juan Fermin Rodriguez, CEO of Kingo Energy, which provides off-grid energy solutions and beyond to communities around the world. So, hi, Juan. So, Juan, perhaps you can start by telling us your story and telling us about how Kingo got started. Awesome. Hi, Ann. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so, my name is Juan Rodriguez, as you well said. Uh, I was born and raised in, in Guatemala. Uh, I've lived here, here all my life. Um, you know, I was raised in a, in a big family, five brothers and sisters, um, an entrepreneur father uh, that uh, worked a lot um, out, into the out in the field in Guatemala, which is a very rural country. Also an entrepreneurial mother taking care of five kids, you know, was definitely a huge, huge challenge for her, but, but um, you know, we're, we were blessed with having such, um, such examples at home. Um, and, you know, I had the, the ability to, to, you know, firsthand absorb, um, you know, what my dad's work was, right, ever since I was little, right? And he took me out into the field in Guatemala and showed me what the, what the deep Guatemala is, as, as they say, right? Uh, in Guatemala, there's about, you know, 60% uh, poverty. Uh, about 15% extreme poverty. Um, there's 23 different languages because there's, you know, a huge uh, indigenous population. So there's a lot of diversity and primarily the country has, um, you know, um, leveraged on its natural resources, um, you know, through, through uh, its economic development, right? Um, but in any case, I had, you know, that, that ability to, to know what were uh, the opportunities in Guatemala in terms of, of, of rural development, right? Um, pretty much, you know, when I was 13, I started my first company. Um, we had a, a, a very, uh, you know, dire economic situation at home where, where my dad, you know, his, his business pretty much, um, you know, crashed into a wall that forced us in a way all to go out into the market and, and work to, to help at home. And, and me and my brothers, we started a fruit and vegetable distribution company. We would wake up at four or 5 a.m., go to the central market, you know, buy the produce, and then we would distribute it to, to you know, schools, restaurants, hotels, et cetera. And, and that really helped. Uh, of course, not only did it help economically at home, but, but it helped you know, develop uh, all of us um, as, of course, uh, entrepreneurs and professionals, but, but it also helped develop a stronger bond um, within my family, right? And, and that's sustained uh, forever. And I, I truly say thank you for that. Um, you know, maybe not as often, but, but for sure, today is a good moment to, to say thank you for that. Um, but yeah, you know, starting to work early was, was a huge experience for me, um, you know, and we pretty much kept that company alive up until I was 18 when I graduated from school. Um, at that point, uh, um, you know, I started working at Procter & Gamble. So I, you know, we left the company behind. Um, it wasn't a huge company, but it, it definitely gave us enough to, to you know, help at home and, and of course start living uh, a young uh, man's life, right? Um, so I started at PNG while I was studying at the University Business Administration, right? So PNG allowed me to, to, to work half time. Um, I was in the marketing department, started looking uh, at very small brands at that moment. Eventually, I, I scaled up, but um, I was able to, to you know, work and, and study at the same time. Um, and um, that was a 
an excellent um, experience as well because P&G, Procter & Gamble, is, is, as you may know, is like the largest um, you know, consumer good company in the world. Um, you know, it's a tremendous university um, to help um, people um, you know, ride a wave where um, results-driven work is, 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 is what's most important, analyzing data, um, and of course, working in, in, in multifunctional teams. Right, um, and PNG was an amazing experience. I worked there like for for three years in my, in the first stint. Um, then you know I had always that entrepreneurial itch, so I resigned to start a, um, a, a publicity agency. I also had a music uh, band in which I, I sang and I played keyboards, and I resigned because you know I started this business with my guitarist, <laughs> which was this publicity agency. The thing is that that. Uh, business lasted for a year. The band was really the reason why we broke up. Uh, then I returned to PNG for another three years um, for a more corporate um, uh, assignment. I was like leading all the marketing efforts uh, within Walmart in in all of Central America. That, that gave me a completely different angle at you know how um, you know these consumer companies worked, how that the real you know trade marketing budgets were applied, etc. Right, but in any case, when I got to those second three years I worked there, I was about 26. Um, and I was going through a very deep you know, transformation um, where I was questioning my existence. And I remember you know, reading Procter & Gamble's um, slogan, it was improving people's lives, right? And I felt it was very hypocritical at that point, you know, considering the reality in Guatemala and you know, making people's hair look puffy isn't, isn't, you know, really improving people's lives, right? And, and I had started reading a lot about renewable energy at that point. Um, and, and I actually started working on the first version of Kingo a year before I resigned from PNG, right? I, I started working with, a, with my co-founder at that point, like every single week and every single night, we were doing a lot of market research and we realized that renewables, you know, it, it was an unstoppable, you know, movement in terms of, of um, the economical and financial traction it was gaining and, and just um, how there was no way for it not to become uh, an important portion of the energy, uh, you know, grid and the energy matrix that we all consume from. But something that was very interesting in that process that year is that while initially I thought I'm going to install solar panels in, in roofs in, in urban towns, we were able to find out that, you know, almost 20% of the population around the world lacks an electrical service, right? Um, but ironically enough, these populations, which are by, by far the poorest as well, there's a very, you know, uh, strong correlation between development and, and access to power. Um, we found out that they were paying for the most expensive energy substitutes, right? They were using candles, kerosene, um, diesel generators. When you, you know, do the calculations and you get the kilowatt hour cost of a candle, you know, it's like 80 times more expensive than what we pay for the grid. So solar, let's say in 2010, combined with LEDs at that point, um, you could combine those um, and offer them to off-grid homes and businesses through some sort of financing scheme, and it would be cheaper than using candles and kerosene and diesel. Right, so that's when it really clicked. Not only, uh, you know, was I going to be able to push, um, you know, renewable power that it, at, at an existential level made a lot of sense to me. It was really, you know, aligned with my values. But, you know, it was like a double whammy. We were going to do social impact as well, right? And, and that, that was, I think, what what allowed me to to leave everything behind. Of course, I was 20, 20 24, 20, 25, 26. When I started working on the project while still at PNG, then I resigned and, and I didn't have kids. I was married now, I have both wife and kids. Um, and at that point, it just made so much sense to, to you know, leave this behind and really at such a, a pivotal time in my life, do something that really resonated um, at a spiritual and existential level, right? So, you know, the first version of the company was, was actually not named Kingo. It has a very similar mission. It was called Quetzal. 
Uh, at that point, the company, you know, would buy uh, off the shelf systems from Alibaba. Um, and then we would, we, we found um, a way to partner up with microfinance institutions and banks to offer the financing to the end users. And there was a lot of demand and we thought it was just gonna, you know, just explode really fast. Um, and, and this of course required for us to, at that phase, um, do everything. We were two people in the company we would pretty much leave on Monday because I live, live in the city, right? But our customers are very far away from the city. So I would go on Monday, come back on Saturday or Sunday uh, to see my family. But, but uh, you know, throughout um, those, those days, we would actively go to the communities and promote um, our solution, which again, received a lot of demand. But when we try to plug in that demand to the financing process that was out of our control, um, we were only processing around 10 to 15 percent of the customers that had requested the service. And, and pretty much it was so inefficient because um, we didn't control the financing and who controlled the financing would rather sell a motorbike for a thousand dollars and finance it to it's still, you know, um, you know, uh, you know middle or, or low class communities. Um, that were an hour or two away instead of five hours away, which uh, were, that's where our customers lie, right? Um, so we tried this model for about two years. We were pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, and, and it really didn't scale to the point that the money that we had put in and we had actually done a seed round under that um, model, we, we pretty much flopped, right? So towards the end of, of, of 2012, um, you know, either we, 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 you know, changed the business model and pivoted or I went back to PNG pretty much. Um, so we decided to pivot. We pretty much closed down operations, but we had story, we had traction. Um, and we came up with, with, you know, a second aha moment where we decided to do our, the financing ourselves. Um, and what resonated at that moment a lot was to try and piggyback on other sectors' experiences um, or, or successes. And, and, and the one we used was the telco success uh, in developing countries when they inserted, let's say, the prepaid concept that really allowed um, for cell phone consumption to just explode, right? In Guatemala, for example, today, there's more cell phones than people. And it's pretty much because you know, 90% of the cell phone lines are prepaid and people are able to, to pay according to their, their out-of-pocket um, availability, right? Um, so, so that entailed, of course, um, a huge challenge because there wasn't technology available in the market for you just to buy a solar system that now had prepaid mechanisms um, that we could just plug into the market. Um, that, so that pushed us to the point that we started to develop our own tech, right? Be like, I'm not a technical person. I'm a marketing and sales person, right? So at that point, when, when we pivoted, I was lucky enough to meet my, my second co-founder of, of, of what now is Kingo, right? Um, and my second co-founder, his name is Peter Kasperwicz. He's from, from the UK. He's a PhD in physics. Uh, you know, he, he, he totally understands, um, um, you know, electromechanics, um, and of course, he, he had also a, a, a software background, so he was, he's like a genius, right, and, and so I was just super lucky to, to meet him pretty much through Facebook. We had a couple Skype calls. I convinced him to come because we had this idea, right, um, so he came to Guatemala. We started developing the first version of the tech. We pretty much did it, did it in, our, in, our, um, in our garage at my parents' house, and we you know, we prepared the first 50 Kingo systems, which were old Quetzal systems that we just refurbished. We put this prepaid mechanism in them and we put them out into the market. We tested out these first 50 homes. It was a huge success in very similar communities. Again, than the ones that we were um, penetrating before. Um, but what was very important at that point is that we figured that um, to be able to operate these systems, um, you know, the, the prepaid mechanism had, a, a, let's say, a very important barrier, which is that 50% of communities without electricity don't have uh, cell phone coverage. So we needed to develop a way to activate and deactivate these units without cell phone coverage, right? So we started developing algorithms and software applications so that shopkeepers in these communities could sell 
the prepaid credits to these users. And then my Procter & Gamble experience really kicked in, right? Because it was it became like a mass consumer company, right? Where in Guatemala, for example, P&G, 70% of their revenue comes from these small mom and pop shops that are out in the rural communities, right? So, so my experience kicked in, Peter's experience kicked in, and we started scaling. We were able to, at that point, get another seed round. And also we complemented that with a grant from the Inter-American Development Bank, which is, a, 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 let's say, a, the, the biggest development bank in Latin America. We scaled the, the pilot from 50 homes to 1,500 homes. And then we really had a story, let's say, to go and, and raise a, a, our Series A. We raised our Series A. Um, we scaled then to right, like 10,000 homes. Then we did a Series B. And then we're right now actually raising our Series C. Um, so up to now, we have like 60,000 homes. Um, in Guatemala, now we're also operating in Colombia. Throughout this process, we did have a couple of, of franchising efforts in, in, in uh in um, South Africa and Cambodia. The franchising effort really didn't work because we just provided the tech to these local partners that in the end face the same challenges that we did at the beginning. You know, there's, there's one thing is to get the tech. Now you can actually buy similar systems um, in Alibaba if you look for them. But, but the hard thing is how do you integrate the technological IP with the commercial IP? These communities are what they call the last mile, right? And, and the last mile is completely abandoned by traditional distributors, traditional companies. Everything that people consume in these communities, either families or businesses um, or, or, or even individuals, they have to go out from the communities, buy these products, goods, services, produce, whatever, they bring it back to the communities. So what we started doing is creating our own distribution channel to effectively offer the best service. What I can tell you is that throughout that process, we made a lot, a lot of mistakes, right? I can mention a few before, you know, we can, we can um, dive in into uh, the other part of the conversation. But for example, one of the biggest learnings was that as an entrepreneur, we are very romantic, right? And especially with the ideas that we come up with, right? And you stick to those ideas in it. Usually, well, not usually, half of the time it may take you to a good place, but a lot of the times it can get you to a bad place. So for example, we had had this, this success with our, with our Series A technology, which was the version one that we call today. So we thought, look, the version one is working great in this, you know, market that, that we have today or this you know size of the customer base that we had we said we have to push the accelerator this will be the next unicorn let's just you know grow as fast as we can so we just grew dramatically fast with that series a right uh, we were installing i think like 3,000 systems a month right uh, so pretty much after three four months we had eaten up the cash and revenue grew for sure but what was happening is that we weren't savvy enough to understand what churn meant at that moment, right? And churn is a huge word for any entrepreneur, either in a retail or business, uh, sorry, retail or service business oriented models. Um, and what we figured out later is that we were having a lot of churn. And why was this happening? Is because people were hacking our units. The, the version one of our tech was very basic. You could break up the unit, you would take out the battery, you would connect it directly to the panel or to the, to the light bulbs, right? And, and, and people would get free energy. Of course, the system would die out because it wasn't protected. But essentially, at some point, we had like 25% of our units hacked. So not only did we lose the revenues, but we lost uh, the assets, right? And of course, you know, at that point, that was what our investors wanted and we wanted to grow, right? And, and growing, of course, that fast in hindsight is what gave us the learning to develop version two and version three and version four of the technology. But hacking still continues. People still want to hack, you know, and, and, and we're talking about uh, very poor communities where they're living on a day to day. Um, but I would say that that's a perfect example of how we spend so much time you know, perf perfecting an idea, right? And once we have that idea, we try and push it, push it super, super hard to the market. 
um, instead of being more agile, right? So we started incorporating a more agile methodology, um, you know, style of operating in, 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 in Kingo, which for, for, for all of the listeners, many of you may be aware, but agile is a very uh, common methodology used in software development. And if, if you were to use an analogy, you know, you don't build the rock it's in day one, right? You, you first build a scooter. And then after you build the scooter, you know, you build the bike, uh, the bicycle, then you build a bike, then you build a car, then you build a plane, and then you build the, um, the rocket, right? And, and if you can kind of like organize your growth that way, Absolutely. you're going to be well off because you're going to save a lot of resources, save a lot of frustration, uh, and extend the cash that you have without actually burning it too fast in, in mistakes. So it sounds like uh, a lot of these learnings along the way probably served you as you were thinking through how to deal with this crisis. So for a little bit of context setting, can you tell us a little bit about where Guatemala is in terms of its management of the coronavirus? And can you talk to us a little bit about some of the tactics that you've had to implement these last few weeks and months in response to this contracting market and specifically dealing with cash flow issues? Perfect, I, I know about that. Um, so uh, in, in context, let's say, because we operate in two countries, I would say both countries had a similar reaction. Um, Guatemala and Colombia, let's say, are still developing countries. Guatemala a, a bit further behind than, than Colombia. But let's say we were benefited by the fact that um, we were late in terms of having our first case, right? that allowed governments to react faster, right? Um, so effectively, both countries really uh, implemented a lockdown in around early March, right? So, so we've been in lockdown for about two months, maybe similar to European countries or, or even you know, Asian countries. Or, um, but the fact is that we have very few cases at that point. So the, so the measures have been pretty effective, right? Um, the lockdown uh, meant uh, that um, pretty much non-essential services or, or, or companies were not going to be able to operate. Um, you know, we were blessed again that because we offer uh, uh, such a basic service to in Guatemala around 250,000 people. You know, people need energy to continue their 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 their, their lives. We were able to operate. In any case, we needed to obtain special permissions that we had like a week where we couldn't operate. We didn't gener generate any revenue in that you know, first week in, in March. Um, but we were able to, to eventually work through the permits. And of course, in that same week, um, internally make a lot of decisions in preparation to COVID, not, in terms of, not only in terms of security and, 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 and the well-being of our employees, but of course, when we were going to go out into the market um, in regards to how we were going to contact at every single one of our consumers and shopkeepers, right? But, but that's when, when we started kind of like thinking, you know, what is the, the impact of COVID going to be in, in our sales and in our capacity to fundraise because we're currently fundraising. So, so I'll just go back to the, to, the, to the decisions that the government made and then talk a bit more about the tactics. But in general, the government uh, had a lockdown where you couldn't go out from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m., um, anybody that's out uh, after those times, you know, would be would be you know taken to to jail pretty much uh, and fined. Uh, eventually, uh, restrictions started to to increase in terms of using masks um, instead of, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, large uh, meetups. They were canceled. So, so I think it's pretty similar to to many of the other countries. But the government, I think, did a good job. Both governments, in terms of of, of realizing the reality of their countries. If they didn't act, act fast, um, our medical infrastructure was really, really gonna be put in, in, in risk, right? In Guatemala, just to give you a sense, there's like, at that point, there were like 250 ventilators in the whole country for 60 million people, right? Um, so, so here they, they knew that they had to flatten the curve, extend you know the, the the period of 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 lockdown as much as possible so that they could prepare these you know temporary hospitals get more uh 
tools for the medical um, teams, and of course, get more respirators and, and ventilators, et cetera, like right? So very proactive. For sure, and I think they're preparing for a second wave, really, because over the last two weeks, like you can't keep on lockdown uh, an economy, right? Uh, for such a long time, especially like ours, where you know tax collection is very low, the the the, the, the you know um, the, um, the safety plans that they set up in place, which was giving people like one hundred and fifty dollars if you consumed less than one hundred and fifty kilowatt hour of uh, a month that was a way to kind of decide who they're going to give these these checks to you know they they pretty much already expired right so there's no real solution so the economy has started to activate a bit um of course with the expectation that there's going to be a second wave which i think is key for governments to consider that there's going to be a second wave um and that the restrictions of using masks social distances distances sorry should should and will sustain probably for six months to a year up until the vaccine is is available, but even then, you know, how many vaccines are going to be available in Guatemala, right? Uh, but we need to get the economy because uh, rolling, because when when hunger is going to be felt, violence is really going to escalate, and both Guatemala and Colombia are countries known for 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 some violence, right? So, so I think that they've 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 done a good way, a, a good amount of work to to manage uh, the situation. Um, and, you know, um, we're doing our, our best also to internally uh, apply these restrictions and, of course, keep the economy alive, keep our service alive. Uh, and to do that, um, we have to make a lot of hard decisions. Now. So I can now start to talk about a little bit about the tactics that, that uh, we started analyzing. It's been really two months of constant iteration of our original plan. So effectively, the first thing was... We were so blessed that right before COVID, we had received the approval of one of our investors that was coming into the Series C. So our Series C is a $24 million uh, round. Um, so with that uh, investor that had approved, let's say we had closed around 13 of the 24, right? We had already eaten up a huge portion. So really just about five of those were readily available. But we had projected that we were going to use that money really fast because we were in full growth mode. Uh, but with COVID, we were like, we needed to step two times back uh, and, and consider all of the options to see how we were going to use this money. Okay? But the premise was, how do we extend runway, right? While still maintain uh, a story so that we can continue raising uh, and of course, get to the point where we have a profitable business, right? Uh, Kingo has operated much like many Silicon Valley companies, you know, like with this unicorn uh, mindset, you know, we need to get to millions of users. Um, and to do that, we have to burn a lot of money. Um, and, and that's changed over the, the last year, I would say, with, with, with you know, realizing that you, know, you can commit a lot of mistakes with, uh, with that mindset. Um, but in any case, that's also what investors want. You know, they, they want you to, to, to grow and, and, and to, you know, be that one or two companies or the 10 that they invest in that really give them their upside while the others, you know, flop, uh, which is kind of like many investors strategy, right? Uh, not everybody, but, but some. So, so under the premise of extending cash uh, runway and, and still telling the story, there were a variety of things we needed to address, right? First, we wanted to reduce our burn rate, right? Uh, and this, of course, links to many other um, uh, you know, departments or, or verticals within the company. But how do we extend um, runway, which means reducing burn? We first analyzed, look, today we have 60,000 customers, right? There's around... 35,000 of them that are profitable. And there's 25,000 of them that are not profitable. And they're not profitable because they're in territories that we haven't penetrated that fast, right? So, so let's say when you launch a new territory, you already have, let's say, $100 of costs. So you need to each territory flood pretty fast to get to the point where you get it to profitability and, and beyond, right? Um, so we said, how long is it going to take 
for us to flood these territories to profitability? That was one question. And the other one is how much market is there still available in the territories where we already flood, right? So we said there's still market there and it's gonna take a long time to flood these ones. So let's say COVID is gonna last a year. If we're able to close these territories down, use all of the assets that we had here, plus the assets we had in the warehouse to continue uh, pushing the already profitable territories, it would give us pretty much the same effect, but we would lower our, um, our burn rate considerably. Let's say from a story standpoint, it kind of, it, it, it did, you know, we would take a hit because we would say, oh, we're gonna go from 60,000 customers to, you know, 35,000, right? You know, it's, it's a much smaller company, but not from, from a profitability standpoint. That was the, the, the priority. How do we, you know, get to profitabil profitability faster rather than grow the company on a user base faster, right? So essentially, for, throughout the last two months, we've been scaling down these territories to the point where we're going to close them down up until um, June. Uh, that's, let's say, how much time is it going to take? And essentially, we're going to lower our OPEX and um, spend by around 35%. It's a, it's a very big cut, right? And it, of course, under COVID, it's, it's tremendously hard to make that decision because people are, are losing their jobs, right? Um, and we'll come back to that point of how we try to manage it, right? Because, because it can generate a lot of noise. Uh, and of course, uh, it's not in line with our, with our mission of being a, a social company. So, so that was the first decision, you know, how do we, we turn to profitability faster uh, and how we double down on profitable regions, right? Forget about being a big company. Profitability is, is the priority, right? So that was OPEX in general. Since we were going to have a smaller company, let's say, um, we were going to be able also to lower our, um, our overhead, right? So in the end, we're going to be lowering our overhead around 15%, not as, as aggressive as in the OPEX side, because we do have additional plans to continue growing in parallel, which hopefully I'll be able to tell you uh, further along. Um, but so, so between cutting overhead and OPEX, we had a huge burn reduction. Um, and then in parallel, that also meant we would reduce our CapEx investments, right? Uh, King was a very intensive CapEx uh, company because we buy solar units, we have to put them out there, we have to fix them, we have to buy spare parts for them. So um, in consideration of that, of COVID, and also just for you to know, there were interruptions, interruptions in supply in China, right? For about two months, pretty much everything was in lockdown. We couldn't order kits. At that point, it meant like, oh, what the hell? What are we going to do? We're not going to have systems in the future to, in, to install. But in the end, you know, that, that helped. But it, but it turned our, our, our focus towards how many units do we have on the floor that um, may require less CapEx investment, let's say units that were uh, not functioning that we could fix, um, in order to put those units out there instead of buying more units from China uh, in a time where there was uh, uh, low supply, right? Um, so our, our put you off here. We have, uh, we're more than halfway through the webinar. We have a bunch of questions from entrepreneurs coming in. <laughs> Uh, and for those of you who want to ask questions, I want to remind you, please use the Q&A function in uh, Zoom to ask your questions. But we have a question coming in from Slovenia. Um, Tiasha? Hi, this is Tiasha from Seed Slovenia. Uh, thank you very much for your, this great conversation so far. Um, and basically what I was thinking, like during the past two months uh, in Slovenia, we spoke with some of our top entrepreneurs uh, and kind of the common grounds is the change in consumer behavior uh, and habits. You already mentioned that one. And uh, the, the point was that we, we will have to transition to intangibles like, you know, rebuilding uh, customer relations, solidarity and empathy. And your business actually already has that, has that in your uh, DNA and uh, you're fully committed to a social impact, sustainable business. Um, and yeah, you are also 
recognized um, with, with some of the world's most prominent uh, environmental activists like Leonardo DiCaprio, which I'm sure you'll mention. And my question is, do you think that um, this is your point of advantage? Uh, so you know that you are sustainable, green, with social impact. Uh, do you think that this is your point of advantage now in this uh, situation? And in what way? Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Tasha. Um, so we definitely have um, felt the COVID impact in consumption. Um, um, of course, we are again blessed. I didn't know this when I chose to, you know, get into energy. But but energy, I, I would say, one of the, the sectors that has been maybe the, the least impacted because it's it's such a basic, um, you know, service. It's even a right for us to to continue uh, our livelihoods, right? Um, so we felt, let's say, that consumer um, usage of our service has decreased by about. 10 to 15%, let's say our average revenue per user dropped in April versus March about 10 to 15%. Uh, I would say it's been um, linked to different reasons. One is of course, uh, people either are receiving less money, uh, their paychecks are, are, are cut in half or they lost their jobs. Uh, and also we have had more difficulty getting into the communities, right? Because communities are taking their own decisions and blocking access to foreigners, right? So, so between not being able to get into communities and receiving the, the impact from, from just consumption in general, revenues did drop, right? And we are projecting a drop in revenues throughout the year. So we're projecting drop in revenues per user plus uh, a much slower uh, customer acquisition, right? We were projecting installing around 3,500 new customers a month. Uh, now we're projecting in the first COVID months around 1,500 units a month, and then it's going to scale up to like 2,500 units a month. And we're trying to play it safe, right? Because if we over, you know, promise, we're just, you know, bullshitting ourselves. Sorry, sorry for the word, but but essentially, you know, we could shoot ourselves in the foot if we decide to go too fast because we're going to burn the money too fast, right? So. So again, in terms of the story and the narrative, it has to link to reality, right? If you're raising money at the same time. So, so we slowed um, uh, the, the growth projections. However, I think to your point is, is it allowed us to strategically think about other opportunities that we had uh, completely kicked the can uh, on for, for several months. And, um, you know, we, of course, are an energy company, but when you strip out the energy, we are a distribution company in these communities. There's nobody else that comes to these shopkeepers, that comes to these, you know, populations on a weekly basis. We, we go to these communities twice a week. One is a person that comes to what we call a pre-sales team, comes to the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper pretty much sells, uh, sorry, the, 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 the pre-sales team sells uh, prepaid credit to the shopkeeper um, and then uh, we have a second team that is a delivery team that takes King goes in and out right so we have a very heavy distribution cost and throughout the, the last year we were arguing that our market is much bigger than just energy because we're talking about a hundred percent of the families in these communities are not actually buying a lot of things uh, other than energy um, so we said, uh, what if we actually, under COVID, launched this project that was kind of like in the archive, uh, which is a very strategic move that will have an impact in the short term uh, in terms of instead of contracting our market under COVID, expanding the size of our market. And, and that was like a huge breakthrough, like how many companies are able to expand the size of their market under COVID? So what we said is, you know, there's three, five products that are you know, key products that people need in these communities that are not necessarily linked to only energy, that we can plug into our distribution model, which again is very expensive. So we were going to kill two birds with one stone with this project that we're calling Project Goose. Um, and essentially is we're able to increase revenue per visit and lower our costs per visit 
because essentially you're able to attend more shopkeepers and more customers with the same costs, right? So essentially we're bringing very basic agricultural products, for example, pumps that people use to, to you know, um, take care of their, of their crops, right? They, they, they essentially use fertilizers and pesticides for their crops that has recurrency, um, it has impact because we're helping people develop their, 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 their uh, lots of land, right? That was one. Another was veterinarian products. A lot of people have livestock. They need, you know, um, food. They need medicines for their livestock. Another was medicine, medicine for people, right? We're, we're, we're actually bringing medicine in the truck that we sell through the shopkeepers. Um, and finally, uh, we saw that there was also uh, an opportunity to, to plug in things that would consume energy from the Kingos, right? Which were, um, you, know, um, you know, other products that, that are a little bit cheaper than the ones that we were bringing. Traditionally, we were bringing just, you know, TVs and refrigerators. Right now we started bringing torches and radios, like lower ticket items. And the final product that really, you know, rang a bell in terms of energy was, uh, you know, efficient stoves and actually uh, LPG, um, uh, cylinders, right? Uh, propane gas, essentially, that also has this, you know, 100% of our customers, they cook with an open fire. They use, uh, you know, wood, uh, and there's a lot of problems with the smoke, etc. So, so there were like these five different categories that, that essentially we could plug in into the same truck that was most of the time half leaf filled up, and we're going to grow our customer base, grow our revenues, with actually just increasing the working capital a bit and, and not using any other resource, right? So it was like a great opportunity to introduce this under COVID and it's a very strategic move that will have impact in the long term and in the short term. Um, so a month ago, we had Jeff Hoffman right. speaking about the three R's and the opportunities to retool and uh, take inventory of the assets. And it sounds like that's precisely what you did, really thought through that the district last mile distribution is your greatest asset and how to really leverage that. Um, we have another question coming in from uh, Tunisia. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Sonia from uh, C Tunisia. And uh, here is a question from uh, one of our entrepreneurs over here. Uh, in your opinion, how someone can reinvent his or her business to thrive after coronavirus? Well, I think, well, it's a, it's a very hard question. You know, we're, we haven't gotten to, to an answer yet, but, but I think the first, the first thing to do is is, is to really um, question the, the business fundamentals and the business economics, right? Uh, on where you are today, right? Um, and this has to do a lot of times with, with cash, right? Um, if, if you wanna give your business a chance under COVID, it's, it's first focusing on what you know you're doing right. You know, and, 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 and you have to extract your ego from this, from this um, question, right? Because typically, again, we're very romantic and, and we tend to, to push just this idea that we know is going to work, right? Um, and that typically requires a lot of, 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 of you know, um, self-awareness, but also it also requires you for, to, to expose yourself and ask others, right? And, and I've gone to my board in this process a lot, right? And to, of course, my co-founders um, and in, in, in that process for me particularly for example going from 60,000 customers to 35,000 customers was tremendously difficult I didn't I didn't realize that in one day it was through talking with with every person that I mentioned every day for for a month you know and, and each day I kind of like I had a baby step towards the point that I, that I realized that that wasn't working and under COVID my initial perspective was actually going to kill the company. So again, you need to really, through the numbers, you know, realize where you're standing and understand what cuts you need to make, right? So under COVID, if, if you cut, it's a good thing, right? Um, but then on a more like existential level, we also had a lot of questions, right? Um, like, what do we want to do, right? Are we here just to honor our investors? 
You know, are we here just to keep that story going, even if we know it's going to crash? You know, or, or you know, Kingo has been an energy company for for ten years, and pretty much under COVID, I said the hell with it. You know, it's it's actually a distribution company, and when I come to think about it, it it, it will resonate with my investors because I'm bringing more impact. I'm you know, pretty much doubling the size of the market because I'm going to start selling more things to uh, impoverished communities, right? And my investors are development, you know, uh, banks, development agencies. And of course, we have a lot of venture investors, but that, that this new story with, with Goose, let's say that I mentioned, is not going to resonate to them is also fear that I thought... Um, they were not going to be open to it. They were not going to accept it and that they were going to think I was a liar because I told them this was an energy company, you know, and, and I'm just, you know, just coming out naked here. Um, it's been a very difficult time in terms of, of, of realizing that, you know, we're, we're, we're doing our best and doing our best actually sometimes means um, accepting that you made mistakes, that you need to change. And this is a time to make dramatic changes, right? You're not going to have COVID again. COVID gives you an excuse to make very deep changes. So take advantage of COVID, question your ego, question yourself, you know, question your business, and make these decisions. Thank you. We have another question coming in from Morocco. Hi, Juan, uh, and thanks for a very good, insightful uh, talk. Um, I'm coming in from Seed Morocco, and I have a very good question from one of our entrepreneurs. And so uh, while a lot of our entrepreneurs are structuring and uh, changing their business model, do you see any problem with uh, re-entering territories that you've chosen to close down? And will your customers feel that you've sort of let them down and you've sort of changed as a company overall? I would love to hear your um, take on that. For sure. Um, I would say we, we, we would intend to go back to these territories in the future, um, but with a completely different mindset, right? When we started growing in these other territories, we didn't have a clear commercial and expansion strategy. We thought, you know, we have a, a product that is cheaper than the substitute. Everybody will love it. This will just fly, right? But that was a, a, a very deep mistake because we didn't understand the market that well. And actually the order of, of doing things was where we, where we uh, made the mistake, right? Um, in a way with this premise that we had uh, romantically uh, undertaking that, that, that it was just going to well, be well received and that operationally it was going to fly. Um, what we didn't do was what I'm going to say now. The order that we're going to do things now is first you effectively validate the market. Before we validated the market, but just did it digitally. We use satellite images, day and night images. We would compare the images and we would count roofs that did not have light, right? And then we said, oh, we have these many roofs. Just go there, install there. There's, there's no electricity. And we didn't really take in consideration um, the, what we call now a route, right? If you have a market, you need to have an effective route. Let's say the market is the revenue, but the route are your costs, right? So the only way we're going into any community is that we know there's a market and we know there's a route and the route requires physical validation, right? And the physical validation means that you go, you, you effectively go on the road, you, you, you take notes on what the road type is like, but then you actually go and validate physically how many real homes are there, but very importantly now, how many shopkeepers can sell the credit there. Before we only cared about the homes, not the shopkeepers and the routes. So now we know we will only open a new route if we know that in a day we can visit at least 10 shopkeepers in one day. Because if you can only visit five, then you need more people to visit all the routes that you have, right? And the problem is that these territories that we closed down didn't have enough customers on the demand side and our routes were very inefficient, right? 
So while we focus on these territories that we're keeping, we're solidifying the route so that they're cost effective and that we generate more revenue per route. That will allow me through COVID to be more profitable and that once I'm, I have you know, a, a more sustainable business, let's say take more risk to go back into these territories, but with a sounder strategy of defining the routes and flooding the territories very fast. We grew these territories in two years and we never flooded them, right? Now that the strategy is you flood them, right? However, as you well pointed out, our brand was hit and it, I don't think that's, that's, uh, that's unavoidable, but we were willing to take the hit in order to keep the company alive, right? Um, so what we try to do is be as, as, um, as loyal to our mission in this process. Right? So we went to each customer's home, we went to each shopkeeper's store of the territories that we were going to close down. We effectively told them, look, we're under COVID. First, we were you know, very front about it. Uh, we told them we're going to need to pick up uh, your unit or your shopkeeper phone. We're going to first reimburse you for the credit that you currently have in your system and we're going to give you a small bonus right in the end it was symbolic right because we don't have cash just to you know go giving out for free but effectively each customer that we're picking up let's say you had five dollars of credit we picked the five dollars of credit and then we gave you like ten dollars you know for um for, for thanking you for your service uh, for, for for the loyalty to our service sorry um, and that allowed us to minimize, let's say, the impact. There's some customers that were like, please don't take it, don't take it. But we have to take it out of their hands, even if they don't want it to, right? Um, so, so we try to minimize the impact that way with the assumption that we're going to come back in the future. But I think, you know, it, it's a hit that's unavoidable, right? If you are uh, going to cut down, um, and even with employees, right, we're, we're effectively, we were, we are right now a 350 employee company. After we close down these territories, we're gonna have like 260, right? Imagine. So all of the people that we're letting go, we're, we're telling them a month in advance. Typically by law, you have to tell, tell them two weeks. We're telling them a month in advance and we're giving them a small bonus. You know, for people that, are, that work in the field, we're giving them like a, a $70 bonus. It's small, it's like 30% like of what they make each month. Uh, no, sorry, it's like less. It's even like 15% of what they make each month, sorry. But that is one month's supermarket for them, right? And it's, it's again, something that, that is gonna resonate to our brand, that is gonna resonate to the employees that are gonna be left behind. It's a time where you can build culture, Everybody knows that COVID is affecting every company and every person, and everybody is thankful that, that, that they have a job, right? And for the ones that are leaving, we're giving this, this, this small token of, 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 uh, of thank you, but it's also an opportunity to build culture while we do it and make sure that everybody knows what we're doing. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks a lot. We have a question coming in from Macedonia. Hello, everyone. I'm Diana from Seed Macedonia. Hello, Juan. Uh, Kingo is a well-known green energy company in the world. Can you tell us uh, what is the key of success for you? And can you tell us more about investment process? We all know that fundraising isn't easy. Well, I, I, I would say the first key to success, at least in my uh, experience, I'm, I'm a very social person. Um, I'm very commercial. So I've never liked to do things by myself, you know? Um, so ever since the beginning, I've always felt that having a counterpart and sharing the pie has been instrumental, right? Because not only are you able to complement your abilities, but you can, you know, split the responsibilities. You can go faster because you have a larger capacity installed. And that typically would mean, oh, I'm going to hire more people. No, what it means is you need to share the pie of the shareholding. Um, and I don't think I've never been too jealous to let, let people in. Uh, so first it was, you know, bringing my co-founder, then it was bringing, of course, investors that added value. And, and sometimes we're, we're struggling to get the best price to get, you know, the best deal to minimize your, your dilution, 
I would say don't fo focus too much on dilution, but get the best partners possible. So for me, that's been a key to success. Can you talk a little bit I, about uh, you, your fundraising process? <laughs> yeah, um, and then on the fundraising, it has totally uh, you know, something to, to, to do with that, right? Um, because we've, we've very specifically targeted you know, investors that have uh, desired uh, capacities, right? So for example, our, our Series A investor um, was a, a family office in Guatemala that had a lot of energy and telco experience, right? And, and you know, it was like, um, it was like bullseye. We, we said, you know, we need to get, talk to this family office. They're going to get it. And they got it, you know, and, and it wasn't like a, a tremendously heavy process where we had 50 leads, leads and it turned down into one. Um, you know, we, we really identified which were those capabilities that we were looking for. We set a good price. It, the deal happened, you know, pretty, pretty fast. Um, that, of course, sounds super easy. Uh, there was actually something that, that happened um, in parallel to that is that this was a mistake. And, and I, would, I would make sure that the... To, to, to communicate this to you is that, you know, with this unicorn mindset, initially we tried and go out and reach the largest investors, you know, the, the most renowned investors, right? The biggest, biggest family offices, because, you know, from an ego standpoint and from a cash standpoint, it makes so much sense. You know, I'm going to get the best investor possible. And in, in Kingo's story, the, the, the C, the Series A, the Series, yeah, up until the Series B, it was mainly local money. It wasn't international money. It was up until the Series B and Series C where we actually started targeting international funds, right? So throughout these first three rounds, C, Series A, and Series B, we went and knocked on the door of the largest family offices, right? We thought, you know, these are a hundred year old companies that have cash, you know, they, they swim in cash, right? And we crashed against those walls again and again and again and again, because we thought that was our target market, let's say in terms of investment, that was the profile investor. And it wasn't actually those big companies, big family offices that had, you know, billions in cash. It was actually a tier below. It was younger family offices, younger companies that were more tech savvy, a little bit more aggressive, and that didn't have this like, um, this like colonial mindset, you know, where they want to be owners of everything. They want to have control. They only have Guatemala or the, the, the Central American countries in their, in their scope, you know. It, it, our story wasn't music to their ears because we were telling them the opposite. You know, you're going to have 10% of the company. We're going to go global. You're not going to have control. So that was a big, big learning. Uh, in, in, you know, going smaller into even more family offices, if that's, that's the cost maybe of having more investors, but that are smaller that, that understand you better. I think that's a big learning that we went through. And that's when we actually started getting more traction in raising our Series A and Series B. Eventually, of course, with the size of the company, uh, you know, the Series B and Series C was easier to get investors. So, you know, we have two of the largest utilities in the world now. We have Leonardo DiCaprio. We have the biggest development banks. Uh, but it was a different story when we got to the Series B and Series C uh, rather than the C and Series A. Thank you, Juan. We're going to try to squeeze in two more questions. I know we're going over a little bit, but this has been an interesting conversation. We have one coming in from Kosovo. Yeah. Uh, hi, all. Hi, Juan. Nice talking to you today. I am Kreshnik. I'm director of SEED Kosovo. Actually, I was prepared to have three questions. Uh, our entrepreneurs had a lot of questions to do to you, but let's start with the first one. And then if we have time, maybe we can go back and uh, uh, check with other two. So first question, what are your plans to re-strategize for the medium and long term? Or can we do a long term uh, planning in this time? I think if you're raising money, you can't avoid uh, do long term planning. For us, long term planning 
is really about, about narrative, right? I would say that 100% of the cases, I have never hit a budget, <laughs> uh, and, and let alone a, a five, 10 year projection, right? So, so I think if you're raising money, um, the, the narrative is what's important and it has to be reflected in the numbers, right? Um, so for example, now I'm talking about Project Goose, um, which is, it, it's, it's an important uh, innovation. It can really change the company considerably, but, but um, to keep the narrative, let's say, I'm not saying, oh, tomorrow I'm gonna divest from Kingo and invest 80% of the resources in, in Goose, right? Um, so Goose makes sense to our investors because it's, it's pretty much uh, just small amount of working capital that's going to get the ball rolling. But, but effectively, our Series C model is 100% dependent on energy as a service, right? Uh, and this is a, merely a, a complement. So I would say for long term, again, um, you have to sustain your narrative. It has to make sense that your growth plans are, are, are realistic but also aggressive in terms of, 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 I don't know, what are the multiples that you're offering your investors, right? Again, we got in this Silicon Valley, uh, you know, mindset. So again, we have to offer our investors a considerable multiple under return. And that's already plugged into the preferences that they have. If I don't grow the company enough, I'll be just paying preferences out and I'll never get a dime out. Um, but yeah, long-term is about narrative. Then totally, you should dive in to, to, to the short term. I've been literally over the two months, 80% of my time dedicated to short-term planning. And that means the next year, right? Or maybe the next 18 months, right? Where I know that this cash and my growth plans are going to help the long-term narrative, but that I know I'm going to hold myself accountable to the growth projections, and then I'm not going to get into a, an issue where I'm going to get fired, you know, in six months because I said, oh, I'm going to double the size of the company in six months under COVID just because it makes the narrative look good, right? So, so again, right now, I've kind of left every single project uh, on the sideline and focused just on planning in, in, in the short and midterm. And I guess, you know, your first question is really linked to, to much of what we started the conversation about today, which is uh, if you have cash in the bank if you're, and you're not a profitable company, which is our case, it's a very different case than if you're a profitable company and you're floating, right? Uh, I don't know how many of the entrepreneurs out there uh, that are floating, you know, you're, you're blessed, definitely. Um, our mindset here and, and our experience is completely linked to uh, bootstrapping, lowering burn, um, and, and making sure that we can sustain the narrative and continue delivering uh, the impact to a, at least the, the existing customer base while increasing profitability. Profitability is, is the name of the game under COVID for us, right? Um, but yeah, dedicate as much time as you can to this planning under your own circumstances um, so that you consider every single angle. And this means talking to hopefully every single person in your board uh, and your mentors, if you have, you definitely need a lot of external perspective to get the correct plan. Don't just dive into it yourself and say, again, oh, I have this romantic plan and, and I had no feedback from the market. Okay, thank you, Juan. Sorry, Krishnik. I'm, I'm going to have to move on to the last question from Seed uh, in Tanzania. Yeah, Juan, hi again. Um, I think you've probably answered half of my question, of our question, but uh, yeah, I mean, COVID and everything else, we have quite a few uh, businesses that are thinking about, you know, how to thrive and, you know, and continue to, to exist. So um, if there's anything you've left out with regard to uh, the kind of things that you did to reposition your team, management and resources to effectively put, uh, I mean, the new measures in I place. Think there's there's two things to take into consideration um, or that, I, it, that they're worth mentioning. One, it's kind of linked to the overhead. Um, so we had projected initially that we were gonna cut down overhead like by 20, 25%. But again, our overhead is a small portion compared to our OPEX, right? Um, so when we decided to launch Goose, 
we also did not just say, oh, this is a Hail Mary, it's gonna work and, and it's just gonna fly. So what we said is, um, you know, we are gonna cut down on certain uh, capabilities. Let's say we are working with the administrative team, uh, the, the hardware development team, the software development team, uh, because let's say we have a lot of products that, that, that are up and running. We don't need more innovation there. We would be investing much into the future. So part of those cost reductions, we're replacing them with um, solidifying our purchasing team, right? With Goose, again, we're going to be buying a lot of other products uh, that are you know, not our, our bread and butter. Um, and, and we don't have a very solid purchase team focused on having uh, a portfolio of products, right? We have very specific products today that are three, four Kingos, but we're going to go to have 10, 20 SKUs that we don't manufacture in China that we may be buying in, in Guatemala directly or Colombia, right? So, so we're substituting our overhead expense to move from one side to another. So it's like playing chess a bit, right? Make sure that the resources that yeah, cut if you can, but if you're banking on something else, make sure that what you're banking on is properly, um, you know, invested on, right? Like you have the capabilities there to push the plan forward. So that's, I think, strategically something that, that I didn't mention from, from a capability standpoint. And another point, I don't know how many of you have, have debt, right? Uh, we do have debt. I would say too much. Um, and, and probably we got this debt under the premise that we were going to continue growing dramatically fast. Uh, but under COVID, you know, you aren't going to grow that fast. Um, and, and we are going to be more strained in terms of complying with our obligations. So we are uh, working on with our lenders in our restructuring pretty much to make sure that we take COVID into effect. And that it's not like only Kingo is knocking on their door. Uh, to restructure because everybody is getting hit from COVID, right? Some tech sectors even more than us, but I'm sure that development banks that are our lenders, let's say, uh, I don't know, more than 50% of their portfolio is gonna probably need to be restructured, right? So, so think about how can you at all moments, of course, come with a sound story, with a story in which you are making sure that your lenders feel comfortable, that you're committed to honoring every single one of your obligations. And of course, you, you then put that in, a, in an action plan in which everything is going to get paid in time and that you're, of course, going to maintain your, your credit uh, history and, 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 and your record um, intact, right? So that is, is something that is definitely taking us uh, some or some effort throughout this planning to make sure that that we restructure it in a way that we honor our commitments, but that we are also able to to grow because we pay a lot of interest uh, on a month to month basis, and and we want to make sure that between the interest and the principal that we are able to pay, that we don't put the company at risk. And they're open because they know that if I dedicate a lot of the resources just to pay them, that at some point you know. I, if I don't grow, they won't get paid either, right? Uh, our investors, our lenders, typically we're talking about seven-year tenors, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's you know a long term to to figure things out and, and get everybody uh, paid, right? So, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to cut this conversation short. But to summarize, I mean, thank you so much for your insights. I'm hearing that for you, you saw COVID as an opportunity to really reimagine your business. Um, and for all the entrepreneurs, it really is about staying alive. So as a leader, you're focusing on the next 12 to 18 months, and it's all about profitability. And, you know, as we all know, it's so easy to fall in love with your business and the core of your business. But what I'm hearing from you is it's really important to surround yourself with advisors, with board members, and with mentors that will give you great feedback. So as you are making these deep pivots, that you're constantly checking yourself and getting feedback from from everybody around you. Would you add anything to that in your, in your closing remarks? Um, you know, it's, it's a tough time. Um, it's been hard uh, emotionally, spiritually. Um, but I was talking with my mom the other day about uh, El Quixote, you know, this, this, this 
historical book, you know, that, that she loved so much. Um, and we have to find ways to, 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 to be hopeful about the future. We have to find ways to, to you know, be that light uh, in, in all this darkness, in all this uncertainty, in between all this fog. Um, and El Quixote, I think, is, is, is an amazing example of how, you know, under such despair and, and such, um, um, you know, conflict, you can, you can always dream uh, and you can be, uh, you know, that, that to many other people around you, right? So, so if you assume that responsibility that you're going to be, you know, that, that positive uh, spirit around everybody, it's actually going to make you feel better and it's going to make a lot of people around you feel better and hopeful about the future. I'm sure we're going to get uh, out of this uh, much better than we came in. Um, and, and there's something that's going to uh, sustain it in our species after COVID and it's going to help us evolve. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I wish you all the best. A thank you to the seed team, to the SEAF team. Um, I'm really glad to be a part of, of this ecosystem. Thank you so much, Juan, for taking the time. And thank you so much for your honesty and your openness. I mean, it really embodies what we're trying to share here. Um, and thank you to all of you joining us from the more than 20 countries. I apologize if we didn't get to your question today, but we hope to see everyone again in two weeks where you can join us via the same link you used here today. And uh, stay healthy, everyone.